Hi, welcome to the Behind the Balance Sheet podcast, where we meet leading investors and commentators and educate ourselves about the world of investing and the world. Our mission is to remove some of the mystique around investing and improve our understanding of what makes a successful investment or indeed an unsuccessful one. Our goal is to inform, educate and entertain. We hope you enjoy this and every episode. Behind the balance sheet and affiliates and podcast guests may own shares or have an economic interest in securities discussed in this podcast, which is aired for your education and entertainment only. Nothing in this podcast should be construed as investment advice or relied upon for investment decisions. Always do your own research. Chris Bloomstrand is best known for his incredibly detailed analysis of Berkshire Hathaway. He's not only an outstanding value investor, He's a highly accomplished analyst. His Semper Augustus annual letter runs over 100 pages and in the last few years has included that evaluation of Berkshire. His analysis of that stock is the best I've read. In this interview, we discuss his start in the business, his investment approach, why college investment funds make a great apprenticeship for youngsters looking to become analysts, why he writes such a detailed letter, and a discussion and analysis of the long-term outlook for markets. Chris has a simple and straightforward, long-term, value-based approach to investing, and he's just full of wisdom. I really enjoyed our conversation, and you will too. Chris, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I've been looking forward to this for ages. Yeah, Steve, this is terrific. I love the podcast. I love uh, a lot of the work that you're doing, so it's a, it's a thrill to be here. Well, listen... Did you always want to be an investor? I mean, I believe your first investment in a Norwegian tanker company was a zero. Why did that not put you off? So why did you want to be an investor and why did you not get put off? Well, lighting all your money on fire, hard-earned summer job money, some scholarship money that was left over. Um, it's fairly off-putting, um, discouraging. And I, uh, I suppose it's like sports or falling off a horse when you get knocked off either you get back on and go again uh, injuries and in sports you know you kind of fight through them so i suppose oh geez either this is a really bad hobby and you need to find something that you don't lose all your money at every time you do it or you need to figure out what happened and i thought i knew what i was doing i was uh, in college and i'd moved from the engineering school to the business school i'd fancied the stock market always kind of followed stock prices in the tables and at that point i'd kind of fallen in love with it uh, hadn't invested real money yet. Um, that was the zero, uh, but was reading all the books and got into candlestick charting and technical analysis and Bill O'Neill's can slim method, which I think is still a thing with investor, investors business daily. It's a momentum based strategy. And what, what I hadn't gotten around to was actually reading financial statements, which, you know, I think had I done that uh, and learned how to do that before investing dime one, uh, probably the outcome would have been different. And I wouldn't have bought the very large crude carrier company in Norway that went to zero six months after buying it. But I li literally then had to write a note. I got the headquarters of the firm, uh, Nor Tankers in Norway, wrote over to get the annual reports, which I'm sure they thought was interesting because they had failed. Uh, and a couple of weeks later, three weeks later, whatever it was, the financials arrived. I'd asked for three years and read through them and you know really was still an un uninitiated to how to really read and interpret financial statements but you know it didn't take a lot of wizardry to know that that there was so much leverage and the capital structure was so poor the assets were so poor that this self-liquidating structure where they were going to operate these vessels for a period of time uh, and then scrap them and distribute all of the proceeds from whatever was left over and everybody was going to get rich really wouldn't have worked. And it was off from there. And so I you know, learned at an early age, you better pay attention to the financials and you know, very quickly just immersed myself in reading as many annual reports and Ks and Qs as I could. And that has become a repetitive process for life. And I've turned over an awful lot of rocks between here and there and uh, learned a, in what was retrospect a very valuable lesson. I mean, you know, you don't want to lose everything, but I think it was pretty grounding. The thing I wish I had done was in addition to ordering and reading the financials, I wish I'd gotten the stock certificate oh. and framed it and hung it on the wall as a, as a reminder. Uh, in any event, that's 
ship has sailed, I'm sure, on that one or sunk. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll be able to find. I'm, I bet you somebody will send you a copy of uh, Nora Tanker's share certificate so you can frame it and have it as a reminder. But it doesn't sound like you need much reminder. Now, look, you <laughs> started your own firm before you were 30 years old. What gave you the confidence to do that? I mean, that's a big bold move. Well, opportunity knocked and came along. I was managing money for a bank trust company and had been delegated an awful lot of responsibility, was running a mutual fund at that point, Kansas City-based bank. I was operating the St. Louis and the Denver investment offices for them uh, and wound up and you, you can read my letter. I know you've read my letter this year. I told the story about our anchor client um, mm -hmm. and how we were introduced and took over uh, his family's portfolio. Um, he, he he would not, he, he wanted me to manage his money and his family's assets. He was in his mid nineties and, but didn't want to do it at a bank. He had been chief investment officer of a bank trust company, big bank here in St. Louis uh, during his career, um, was the chairman of the board for a bunch of years. At this point, long retired, but uh, really did not want to have banks controlling the majority of his capital. There were some irrevocable trusts where the banks were involved and in, I think, off-putting things like having to indemnify the bank when you're managing your own account for concentrated positions, things like that. You must have seen something in you. You're only 29 years old. I mean, what was it that made him trust you? Is that, I mean, it's a big step, well, especially when you're, you've are you made all that money and, and lived through those cycles. And what was it that you, you that you sparked in him? What was it you, you saw? Well, we had two things, I think. I don't think I've ever been quite asked that question. Um, we had a common belief that we were in a stock market bubble. I mean, this gentleman born in 1903 uh, got into the family brokerage business after Princeton and liquidated uh, his entire family stock portfolio and any clients that would follow a 25-year-old kid to the sidelines. He was a year and a half early. The market nearly doubled over the next 18 months and then ultimately peaked in the fall of 1929 and the 89% drop in the Dow and the Great Depression and the rest is history. Well, at those lows, he bought things like GE for less than the cash in the business. I mean, genuine Ben Graham net nets mm -hmm. before Ben Graham wrote about him in security analysis. The 1934 original edition. I mean, Mr. Smith, Bob was um, my my client was was acting on the bear market because he had capital uh, and not writing about it and was a very accomplished investor. We spent several months um, getting to know each other before we pulled the trigger and and Chad, my business partner, and I hung the shingle. We'd always wanted to run a money management firm together. Uh, hadn't anticipated doing it. Just shy of my 30th birthday. Um, but in getting to know him, I had some, I had a, quite a bit of fluency in really most of the things that he owned because I'd spent time with General Electric and had uh, concluded by that point, I mean, this is the end of the Jack Welch era, had concluded that the culture of GE was rotten. Two thirds of the business was now finance, consumer finance, business finance. Uh, they had the, re the reinsurance operations and the financials have become so complicated. The culture of making the quarter by a penny uh, it, it is not suitable for the insurance world in particular. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, really thought that GE had problems. The leverage in the business, the off-balance sheet, special purpose vehicle liabilities were extraordinary. So, um, you know, one by one, we kind of spent time in the portfolio and concluded that the most of these companies were really no longer objectively earning their cost of capital. Uh, you were late 90s, so prices were sky high. And, you know, I grew up having lost all my money on trade one, but in a culture of a value investing oriented uh, trust investment company, um, you know, I was a price to earnings, price to sales, price to cash flow, dividend yield investor at that point. And it was pretty easy to spot uh, overvaluation throughout many of these blue chips. So you overlay a lot of them no longer being great companies with very high prices. And it gave us the opportunity to then donate a lot of these to a family foundation and some CRUD accounts, which essentially pay a portion of uh, assets, call it income, to the donors for life. And then the assets are left to charity. We were able to clean all that up and liquidate a very substantial portion of the portfolio over the course of a year and a half or so and flip the proceeds into the those those securities that were had gone begging uh the, buy, the market bifurcation was extraordinary at the peak of the tech bubble you had the very 
expensive blue chips really got expensive in 98, around the time we started the firm, late 98, uh, middle 98. That's when Berkshire bought Gen Re using Berkshire shares as currency in that deal. Pepsi traded it 50 times. So all these blue chips were so expensive. And then that kind of morphed to the tech bubble where, you know, not only your internet TMT companies, but legit businesses that I think the world forgets how, how many real businesses traded it at 10 and 20 times sales, tech companies, Microsoft trading at a 620 billion cap on 20 billion in revenues. They were immensely profitable, 38% profit margin. So we sold all that stuff, um, sold 90% of the GE. He had said, well, his, he loved talking about benign neglect, and that essentially, I think, is a pretty valuable, uh, was a valuable lesson for me to observe what it had, the, the family's portfolio had evolved from the 1930s. Uh, essentially, uh, it's the buy the stock, put the security, the certificate in the desk drawer and forget about it for a lifetime. And you're going to wind up with some real winners, but you're going to avoid all the frictional costs of trading. You're going to avoid all the taxes. You're going to avoid all the temptations of thinking you're too smart and outsmarting yourself and uh, sure enough, um, quite a few of the things that he had picked up as a very good investor over the years uh, were, you know, the proverbial you know, 10 and 50 and 100 and 200 baggers. I mean, the basis on on the GE position, which was half the capital, was in the pennies per share. The dividend was larger than the cost basis on the security. And so, but his philosophy of benign neglect, he said, look, GE has been the best performing uh, position that I've had for a lifetime, it's treated the family very well. Uh, but I wholly endorse what you're saying. He says, why don't we sell, I'll, I'll let you sell 90% of it. So with that 90%, that GE is down 80% from where we sold it. They've done a one for seven reverse stock split since. And we've made about 11% on our equity investments over the 24 and a half, now 25, 24, I guess 24 year uh, history of the firm. So, you know, we've turned a million dollars into 11 kind of, you know, before fees and cash, but that million in GE is $200,000. So the yeah, delta there is quite a bit. It must have been quite a brave, he must have been quite a brave guy to sell a stock that had done him that well. And you must have been very persuasive. I mean, GE was one of the five most successful companies in that Henrik Bessenbinder study. And I think if I remember correctly, five companies accounted for 10% of the wealth created in the United States stock market, which was $35 trillion between 1926 and 2016. And it was, it was Exxon, Apple, GE, IBM, forgotten what the fifth one was, but um, it must have been, he must have been quite brave to having done nothing for 60 years. It was just your the persuasiveness of your analysis. That it was, and I think, you know, he, he was a student of what you'd now call behavioral economics, but that's really just common sense and watching how people behave. And, you know, Jack spent an awful lot of time with the street. Uh, the world knew that. Uh, you could see GE when they had to make the quarter uh, taking gains on assets to massage the income number. And and it was just all the abusive things that even in your late 20s, you'd seen other firms do. And, you know, I'd already gravitated toward quality management and uh, the, the culture just seemed rotten. And it was a pretty easy call with the leverage on top of it, uh, the finance businesses, which, you know, they're vapor. I mean, you know, when you have banking and, and, and finance type leasing companies, your liability side, the right side of the balance sheet is crystal clear, very knowable. The asset side is nebulous. And yeah. when you layer in too much leverage and off balance sheet leverage and you hide that leverage and to find it, you've really got to spend a lot of time in the footnotes. And I lived in the footnotes. I still live in the footnotes. I tell students and, and young investors all the time, you know, get off of the books and uh, all of the podcasts, except for yours and the handful that I'm on, of course. But <laughs> Turn over rocks. I mean, you know, build up your your arsenal of companies that you know well. But read every footnote. Read, read the business description. Read the accounting changes. You know, read how re revenue recognition works in those footnotes. And a lot of it's repetitive, and a lot of it's boilerplate. But when things change and you get a new accounting pronouncement, that's when the light kind of goes on, and you say, "Oh, well, this business is going to treat this accounting convention differently than that business." And you wouldn't know that other than you know, immersing yourself and, and taking the time. And so, and, and I'm a slow reader. I'm handicapped by being a very slow reader. So 
you know, I couldn't get through as many businesses as I probably would have liked, but for reading slowly, I think I absorbed an awful lot and still absorb an awful lot when I work on a project and tend to retain a lot of information, weird numbers that, that just kind of have, have been embossed in, in the brain on the brain. Um, but it's, it's the, it's the going slow and really paying attention to what you're working on. I've never been in a hurry to get anything off my desk if it mattered. And, you know, we live in this, we live in this world of immediacy now where even I find myself distracted by the phone because I've got a computer on the phone and I've got screens in front of me with data and, 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 and I've got, you know, I've gotten so accustomed to looking at this ridiculous little Apple phone that I find myself on the Bloomberg app on the phone and not on the Bloomberg, which is insanity because I'm looking at a, looking at a little box, but. Um, this point about looking at the footnotes, I mean, I find it quite extraordinary. So I've got an exercise, you know, I do this forensic accounting course for institutional investors. And um, I have a, a, a revenue recognition note that I put up on the screen. And I say to people, look at that last paragraph and tell me what it means. You know, people sort of scratch their heads and they're really, and I'm thinking, and some of these people own this stock. This is, this is the thing that I find most perturbing so i did one particular course the reason i came to this talk was that i do the course in two halves so i do the first half is about the theory about how people cheat and how people massage earnings and the second half is about how you spot all this and in between i, I leave a week in between because that helps retention and it also gives people a week to think about what they've what i've been talking about and often i'll come in the following and they'll say oh i was looking at this stock and i found this thing what do you think and so sure enough, they, I got asked to look at this particular company because one of the big bulge bracket banks had put out a note saying its R&D policy was suspect. And so I come back the following week and I go to put the R&D policy out. I get the wrong page and I, I turn to the, the revenue recognition note. I say, oh, well, let's look at this. And there were three analysts in this room, all of whom worked on funds that owned the stock. And not one of them had read the revenue recognition policy. And I, why is it that people believe you can just take shortcuts? I mean, I, when we were learning, you, it was drummed into me. This is, you know, you need to understand how the company recognizes revenue. Why do people not pay attention to that? Is it just because it hasn't mattered? Yeah, when you're when you're young and and you're you've immersed yourself, and you uncover those kinds of things, or you find a business that changes, elongates a depreciation schedule of a fixed asset to a now much longer period of time than industry convention. And you go to the analyst that you work with that covers the stock to talk about it, and they have no idea what you're talking about. It's then when you realize that everything you were taught in school about efficient markets is insane because if the world knows all information immediately and acts rationally on it, it was pretty it was pretty apparent that very few people even read the annual report beyond the CEO's letter or the chairman's letter. And how in the world can you have efficiency in the market if nobody knows what the hell's going on? So yeah, well, <laughs> I, mean, well I suppose the problem then is it's like the David Einhorn issue that yeah, I'm doing all this work, but there's nobody, there's nobody to take it. You know, I'll buy, the, I've done the work, I've realized the stock's cheap, I've bought the stock, but there's nobody else looking at it. I mean, do you think he's right about that? No, that's absurd. I, I have a lot of respect for David. Um, but this notion that value investing is dead, you know, price is the great arbiter. Um, assets that are cheap don't stay cheap because those that do appreciate what something is worth aren't going to let it stay cheap for long. If businesses get too undervalued, you see them taken private by the board of directors and the management, um, or you see acquisitions. Um, the, the, the notion that value loses during the latter stages of a bull market, I mean, we've seen just insanity and speculation beyond what we saw in the late 1990s between Profitless businesses trading at 10 and 20 and 30 times revenues between the SPAC craze, uh, even, even where in a world where we've had too much leverage, which has pushed against economic growth, 
We have very little growth in real GDP per capita now, and that's been the case since 2000, since the tech bubble. And so the places where you have organic growth, the market got that right and valuations accreted accordingly, but only, but then to the point where you were overpaying and you, you took the hundred best businesses in the world. Most of them are in the United States. Well, a lot of them are in the United States and they traded at silly prices here in the last couple, three years. Um, you know, even in my portfolio, Costco traded at 50 times earnings. It's a wonderful business. One of the best businesses on the planet. It's not worth 50 times earnings. And you can go through the roster of blue chips, not just tech, not just the big five, what I call the fab five. Not It's not, not just those, but you had an awful lot of overvaluation similar to, I guess, what would have been the nifty 50 in 1972. Yeah. And so if you're a value guy or you're a value investor and you know, you're clipping along making 10, 11, 12, 13%, but the S&P for the 10 years ended 2021 did 16.6% or the fab five compounded for a decade at 29.8%. Well, were you an idiot? And, you know, are you part of this value world that's dying and dead because you didn't keep up with that? Well, if you've got a process like we do that we think we understand what we ought to make per year, because it's, it's a derivative of what the underlying economics of the companies that we own are, and we're earning those returns, we're in good shape. And you get to the extremes where all of a sudden the world wakes up and realizes, oh, geez, price does matter. And I guess that that's when value is always back in vogue. Maybe we're there. I mean, you've still got the market down a bunch this year. We've got energy in the portfolio. So, you know, we were, I was in Zurich speaking at a conference, uh, John Mahalovich's MOI Global in June. And one of the one of the folks in the audience asked me, during my presentation, how are you doing for the year? What are your returns? And I said, well, I'm going to, it's going to be the kiss of death here because I'm going to tell you that we're up about 10 markets down a bunch. And sure enough, that was, that was our peak uh, for that period. We were up a little more in April. Berkshire was way up for the year. Um, a lot of the stuff that we own. And so in literally in eight days, not eight trading days, but eight days, we went from up 10 to down three. We ended June down six and change. We were down 11 at September. And here we are today up 4% or so for the year. And I mean, is that, I mean, it's, it's, it's some trading, picking up some things this year that have advanced since we've bought them. But is it is it the reversion of value? Because now you've got the most speculative corners of the market that have been obliterated. The SPACs have been obliterated. The 20 multiple to sales have been obliterated. But even the excessive valuations of you know, your long duration assets, these great blue chips, and, and certainly these big techs have been have been hammered down for myriad reasons. Certainly you know, rising interest rates are going to push on multiples. Uh, inflation is m very much pushing on margins. I mean, you've got the S&P, which had earnings of 208 bucks at year end 21. Wall Street was looking for 240 or 250. They're always ebullient with the exception of recessions. And there's always a fade of whatever the aggregate of earnings expectations are for the year. They always taper off over the course of the year, unless they're, unless they're depressed, unless you're sitting there in 2008 and earnings are nothing. And then they, and then they under miss, but during a normal market, Sure. They always miss high. So, but now you're back to less than 208. So you've got you've got an absolute decline in profits, but you've got top line sales growing at eight. So that's very real margin compression there. And so no, I think if you look at your value indices, and I don't look at indices at all, but I presume they're better than the aggregates. I'm quite certain they'd be better than the NASDAQ 100, the NASDAQ, probably the S&P 500. I mean, I do know, I mean, the, the S&P 100 is faring far worse than the S&P 500. So much of this is going to go to value. But no, you can't suspend value. I mean, you know, these these businesses that we all have a chance to own trade every day at a price. And this goes to Ben Graham's Mr. Market. I mean, you've, you've had a lot of irrationality and the market has been uh, a, a little OCD here in the last few years, a little manic. And, you know, now you've got uh, a little depression setting in. And, you know, if price matters to you and business quality matters to you, then that's the... I guess what will be the the rise of value, but no, it's silly to think that that value is is gone and a dinosaur and dead forever. That's just yeah. I'm not. I mean, I'm not sure that he think he thinks that. I mean, I think he thinks that you know, in the old days, he could be a bit ahead of the pack, and there would be enough people doing what he did that would spot the things that he'd spotted and 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 come in and buy them from him. And now he's kind of reliant on a private equity bid or 
them buying shares back because it's just there's not the same attention. There's not there's not as many people like you as there used to be, and so uh, and I, I guess there's a, an element of of truth in that. But let's let's turn to your letter because you write this amazing hundred page letter. I mean, why do you do this? It is like so much work and it is so brilliantly written. It must take you forever. I mean, is it just a labor of love? Is it giving you some benefits? Um, what, why, what's the motivation? Well, it, it is a labor of love. You know, I, I very much um, want our clients, those that are willing to take the time with the letter each year to really know how we think and how we look at the world and valuation and the businesses that we own. The letter was never public. Um, we had, uh, at the outset of the firm, as any good value investor would, when the market declined a bunch in 2002, we made a lot of money. Um, it's, it, 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 and all that was in the first two years of that three-year decline. I mean, the market was up, was down nine or so in 2000. And, we were up north of 20, and then the next year, the market was down 11 or 12, and we were up north of 20. And then we fell in line with the market in 2002, but very similar to what a lot of value investors would have experienced. In 08, we were down half the decline in the market, actually beat the market in 09, despite uh, having lost half on the decline. And by the end of 11, and you know, I had this in my letter last year, um, kind of this notion that that you know how you perceive value and how you perceive performance so we were up our stocks now, just just our stocks. Again, no cash and no fees. We've got different cash levels across all of our client portfolios. Foundations that spend 5% a year making grants to charity are always going to have some cash laying around you know, because you got 15% going out the door every 24 months, right? But just, just the stocks had averaged about 11 uh, from inception uh, through the end of 2011. The S&P at that point, because you, you had two bear markets and you were recovered from the 08, 09 lows, but the S&P had averaged something like one. And so we're 10 points ahead of the market. And, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, right, we weren't any consultant databases. The letter was not public. Uh, we had not created our GIPS composites at that point because we never thought institutions would ever want to hire an investor that doesn't hew to certain market cap sizes or certain geographies. We've always had global investments. We've always had small, mid, large cap, not by design. We're simply trying to find great businesses at great prices. Um, but then we had four years in a row where, and, I, and I'd written long letters. So if you go back on our website, um, we have, I've, I've got a, you know, a long letter then would have been 30, 40 pages because that's all I had to say. And it was important to convey what I was saying. Uh, in the, the four year period following 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, during the first three of those four years, we averaged, our stocks averaged about 10, which was no good, of course, because the S&P averaged 22%, I think it was. And then in 2000, and so, you know, some of the some of the clients were, even those that were so far ahead, start to finish, were starting to wonder if maybe we were losing it a little bit um, because, you know, everybody else was getting richer faster. Well, 2015, that was no fun from a client handholding standpoint because we were down 10 or 11. Berkshire, our largest holding, was down 12.5%, and the FANGs led the market up 1.5% or 1.4%. So then, you know, really, we had more, you know, far more of the natives were restless. And, you know, we're not now, we're working the phones or the, you know, the phones are, I've got inbound calls coming. And, you know, what the hell's going on? Are you guys losing it? I think Warren Buffett's gotten too old. He's probably lost it too. And, you know, what are you guys doing with that? Well, the pat answer is, look, you know, neither Warren Buffett nor Semper Augustus can control stock prices for four years. You know, best to look through to the underlying businesses and what we own and have those businesses gotten more valuable over the last four years. Have the new companies that we've bought into the portfolio added value, added intrinsic value to the overall valuation? And frankly, at the end of 15, the portfolio was really cheap, um, uh, nearly as cheap as it had been in firm history. But I, I, I really wanted to write a good letter. Um, and with Berkshire being such a large position and in the crosshairs of so much doubt, uh, I'd always wanted to write up Berkshire and all of the accounting adjustments that I make 
to derive what I call kind of economic earning power, the moving parts of the subsidiaries, how we value each of those on a sum of the parts basis, really all the four or five methods that I would use to value the company I thought was important to, to share with our clients. And so I spent, I don't know, 40 or 50 pages of my 60 or 70 page letter, 2015 letter on the analysis of Berkshire Hathaway and the accounting treatments and the tax treatments. And so we sent it to our clients and 30 or 40 of our friends and our very good mutual friend, Joe Coster, called me and said, Chris, he said, um, you really have to get this letter out to the public. He said, Joe, Joe thought it was, in his mind, he said it was the best Berkshire write-up that he'd seen. And he said, if you want to grow institutionally, you have to get this letter out into the world. And I said, you know, Joe, we'd never put our letters out. Um, Seth Klarman's letters were always private. They get taken down. And Joe cut me off and said, Chris, how much money are you managing? And how much money is Seth managing? And to which I nodded and said, that's a good point. So I said, but look, I mean, nobody wants to read about taxes and accounting conventions and uh, accelerated depreciation and amortization of intangibles. It's just, it's too deep in the weeds. And he said, trust me, he says, if you put it on your website, I'll link it to his value investing world. What was the blog at the time? Terrific. Uh, still a great compilation um, yeah, it's really of good. daily reads. Uh, if you're not a subscriber to Value Investing World, you should be. It's uh, just a Joe, Joe's. It's a really nice daily curation that hits your inbox every day and links to some great stuff that you probably haven't read and figured, you know, found yourself or some you would have. But in any event, um, so you know, maybe a hundred people are going to read this thing. And well, it turned out the 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 breadth and and the the degree to which it kind of got out was pretty spectacular. Um, lots and lots of downloads, lots and lots of reads, and so without it really ever intentionally being a tool uh, to help the firm, um, it, it wound up being a great tool because what's what's evolved is those folks that hire us now, whether they're family offices or institutions or business owners or public company executives, I'm kind of flat. I'm stunned that so many people read the letter and read it every year and take the time. By the time they get to us and are interested in being clients, it's just, it's a highly curated kind of self-selective pool of people that are really smart and happen to you know be curious about investing whether they're and I've got a lot of folks that are just kind of you know, clients that are retired investors that are super investors but they're in their 70s and 80s and they don't turn over the rocks anymore and they have kind of decided they want to have us at the helm of their capital which is terrific and but really more so I'm I've always been so grateful to the Warren Buffetts of the world and the Ben Grahams of the world you know these folks that didn't have to share how they think and the, kind of the secret behind how they think about capital. Warren Buffett didn't need to write the chairman's letter to the degree he did every year and kind of teach the world about various accounting conventions and stock options and inflation. Ben Graham with the books and the teaching. Um, I've, I've, I'm, I'm so blessed to do this because it's never been a job. You know, it's Warren's tap dancing to work is, you know, my 80 hour a week hobby that has never felt like a job. And, you know, when you get to do it for clients and work with people that are just extraordinary people that are curious about what you're curious about, it makes the conversations that you have with your clients fun. But I spent a lot of time on college campuses. I've been a big advocate of student run funds and have tried to curate some best practices in that world. And last two, two letters uh, have, have done some of that. We had a survey that a lot of schools responded to and I think there was some utility there, but I love being on campus. I love working with young investors. I love doing what you're doing and kind of teaching about accounting and investing and some of the things that matter. And so for that, I, I really write the letter with an eye toward a, a wide pool of people that read it, but I want there to be utility for young investors and curious young people that want to do this for a living and kind of pass along some of the things that 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 I've learned to the extent I've learned anything for the same reason that, you know, I've, I'm, I've got such a debt of gratitude that those who have done it before I've done it, that it, well, the, it, it the really drives it, it. It makes it a joy to write the letter, frankly. And the, the letter is brilliant. Any student listening to this should read it immediately. I don't, I don't know how easy it is to download, but um, it's interesting because I, we were, before we came 
before we started recording, I was saying that when I did start the podcast, I had the idea of doing a podcast for young people coming into the industry and and or thinking about coming into the industry and trying to give them, you know, some understand better understanding. And I, I think we've done a, a bit of that. But it's funny how many professional <laughs> investors listen. And I'm sure that a lot of professional investors are reading your letter and wishing they could write as well. I mean, it's really amazing. Just on the student investment funds, I mean, I was quite intrigued about this because I've tried to do as much as I can with universities here a bit in America, but mainly in UK and in Europe. And it's my theory that um, students in the UK are lazy and students in the US are committed and keen. You're laughing. <laughs> I, I am being, honestly, I am being all in all seriousness so students in america are much much more committed they're you know if you come to university here then you know the pub is a great attraction not as much as it was in my day i mean it, it's not it, people are more serious today but not a patch on the us and i was curious about this the investment funds because i i i, I sponsor a couple of these funds and try and help them educate themselves and I go and speak but not as much as I, not as much as I would like to but when you you're writing this year you said the fund size can be as large as 60 million dollars which is really huge average is 6 million median 2 million half had 10 to 30 stocks 40 percent had 31 to 50 stocks turnover 10 to 30 percent at two-thirds of funds over 50 percent at a fifth but the, the great thing about this is it allows students to garner real life experience of managing money, which I think is fantastic. I mean, have you sort of got any observations or conclusions from the, the work that you've done? I mean, obviously, you would rather employ somebody who'd already had experience and the pain of losing money in for real. Is, is there, are there any other benefits, do you think? Well, yeah, but let, let me let me elaborate on why I laughed. Um, I mean, I was an academic minimalist in school. Um, <laughs> but, but, football. but so, so we have, we now have an empty nest at the house. Uh, the baby, our boy, is a freshman in college, and he happens to be at the school that currently is the uh, has the largest student investment fund, and that's not really necessarily why he went to that school. Um, I think if you were to pull, having been at Parents Weekend this fall and having been to the football tailgate and having been in a college bar for the first time since I was in college, I'm quite confident that if I pulled the student body at this university, that they would be a lot more impressed with the fact, not that they have the largest student-run fund in the country, but they that they had just moved up six spots on Barstool Sports top 25 party schools in the country to number four in the country. That was a big deal when we were there. In any event, no, I, I, I'm i kidding, of course. Um, I think through these student funds, and th there weren't that many of them back in the 70s. The Big Ten schools had them, University of Dayton, which, which does have the biggest student-run fund. Some of these things are extremely well put together. They involve, you know, sophomores, even late freshmen, up to seniors. They're run by the students. Uh, they're, you know, overseen by uh, an administrator, either a professor or an adjunct or an outside volunteer. But if you put them together, if you, if you structure the thing properly with the right kind of bumper guards, right kind of diversification requirements, you really create a heck of a, of a teaching tool. And what I've seen as I'm around the country every year and schools ask me to come talk is it's invariably the student run funds that are having me speak. And it's, it's that group that, I mean, they know what they want to do. Generally, they want to be investors. They're highly motivated and they're, they're getting real hands-on experience. You know, they're, they're reading financial statements. They're, breaking down business valuation. They're writing up pitches. Um, you've got to work up a business that you want to include in the portfolio and you've got to figure out what's going to come out. And if you structure that properly, great teaching tools. And I can tell you the, uh, the, the, the big firms on Wall Street and in the mutual fund complex and in the insurance world are making beelines to those 
schools that have pedigrees in terms of long-standing, long-run student-run funds. But there are more than 300 schools that now have them. And I've never met um, a group that that weren't incredibly highly motivated and eager to learn. And I'm stunned at how much more they know than I know, that, 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 than I knew coming out of school. I mean, I was doing it all kind of self-practice because we didn't have classes that taught you how to break down financial statements. You know, when you took your accounting classes, they were cost accounting or they were very project specific no, finance I, classes where you're doing DCFs on whether you should build a building or not, or, you know, build a new plant. It had nothing to do with how to value a company. And um, no, I completely agree with you. I mean, kids now are much, much more um, aware and, and, you know, I've, I've been stunned by the quality of some of the research notes. I mean, they could have, you know, they could come from a bulge bracket bank, except that they're probably better. Um, you know, they, 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 the kids really take a, a, a pay a lot of attention to it. I, I mean, I've seen some amazing ones and, and, you know, not just in the UK, but in Europe. I mean, I've sponsored the, um, the Finance Society at the University of Vienna, which is a huge university and really remarkable. Some of the, some of the students, but one one of them has just come to to do a doctorate in or a master's at Oxford. I saw him. He came to the Sohn conference with uh, you know the Sohn hedge fund conference. We, they have it in New York. They have one in London. So he came along with me. But let, let, let's just go back to your letter and the S and P five hundred valuation. Because you 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 look at that very very closely, and I just wondered what's the purpose of that. I mean, is that does that help dictate how much cash you hold in clients' portfolios, or is it just a framework? What why so much time on that? Well, the world's just acutely aware of what the S and P five hundred does. To the extent that we own component members of the index or not, we don't hew to a benchmark. But you can't not marvel at the big five tech companies, um, Apple, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and Facebook, Meta, whatever they call themselves these days. It, it was the 10 the year run they had was extraordinary. And again, they weren't alone. Matt, you know, take MasterCard, Visa, you know, some of the other great businesses, you know, had like uh, terrific runs over a period of time where you had a lot of organic growth, top line revenues, not acquired, not from reinvent reinvested capital but genuine growth, um, but a lot of multiple expansion, um, margin expansion in some places, not in others. But when you're doing almost 30% a year for a decade, at a point, they'd consume so much of the stock market. I mean, that group went from 8% of the market a decade ago to almost 25%, 24.9% at year end. Yeah. And sure. you had to be aware of that. And the group was trading at 30 to earnings. It drove the overall profits of the index markedly higher. I mean, you took those five stocks out of the index. The S&P didn't do 16.6. It still did 14.3%, which was pretty extraordinary. Oh, did it really? God, I, I, that surprises me. It's that high. I haven't done, I haven't tried to do. Because the, the way you do this, I think, is really brilliant. So you break down the total return into the multiple expansion and the EPS growth. And the numbers, I... I really love the way you did it. So this is a, this is the ten years to end of twenty twenty one. So the S and P total return sixteen point six percent. So the multiple expanded from twelve to twenty three point six. So six point one percent per annum. So we've had a bit of a correction in multiples, but not that much. I mean, where do you think that multiple goes over the next ten years? Because in an inflationary environment, we should see a contraction in multiples, no? Yeah, so I, I'll have, so Jim Grant was really nice to ask me to speak at his conference mm -hmm. um, uh, back in October. And I updated the work that I had on the annual letter to account for the decline in the Fab Five and the decline in the S&P 500 to show what a 30% decline in the tech companies and a 20% decline in the index had done to the long run picture. I didn't really present the full bear case, which would involve uh, durable inflation, perhaps. But, you know, if you, it, it, all I did was took the multiple back to its long run average of 15 and a half as one of the as one of the cases. And I took the margin back down to various levels. 13.3 percent, I think, was unsustainable. Three percentage points of the the, the gain from nine 
over the last 25 years has come from increasing corporate debt on the balance sheet, but at, at increasingly low interest rates. So the interest burden is not that high. And you got three full percentage points of the 13.3 that came from a lower interest burden. Oh, really? Uh, the tax code change in 2017, the TCJA, that took the rate from 35% to 21% on the U.S. portion of profits, which are about half of profits, that added almost a percent to the uh, to the margin. Yeah, you know, I think to your point, if you were to take the and 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 you know Warren Buffett turns out was wrong. If you go back to I think it was 1999, he had a speech that he'd given at the Allen gathering in Sun Valley, Idaho, that he then turned into an article that he wrote for Fortune magazine. The premise, though, was really that margins are mean reverting. And in his lifetime, he'd seen profit margins kind of range between 3% and 6%. And you had broken out of that. And by uh, 2000, you took the profit margin up to 7.5%. So you know, only at one moment in 1929 was the margin higher. It was uh, 9.5% or 9.4%. But most of the time, you were kind of range bound. But again, think about his investing career to that point. A lot of it involved the two decades of high inflation. And so I've actually got some some work that I'm doing uh, for this year's letter that you know, I'm starting to gather some of the data, but I don't, I don't really start in earnest on the letter until January 2nd, but I know I'm going to have a section on, on what the inflation of the 70s look like. Oh, brilliant. There's this conventional belief, I think, that inflation was fairly linear, that it just accelerated and kept growing. And that Paul Volcker came in as the hero at the end and had the spine to break inflation and take interest rates uh, to 20% on the short end. The long bond got up to 1571 or 1578. But it took it took that willpower of raising rates to, to break it and, you know, tolerate a really bad recession in 81, 82. But if you look at the, if you look at the stock market uh, over really the the mid to late 60s. I mean, in 1966, Warren Buffett stopped taking money into his partnership, uh, gave the money back in 1969. He called that market top, essentially, through the action of saying, uh, my, my skill set here is no good anymore. Uh, I don't really get this game where prices are this high. And he was right. It was That was the end of the bull market. But you had this series of and the market was sideways. I think people know that the market was sideways for 17 years. The Dow was 995 in 1966, and it dropped 20%, then it recovered to 1,000, then it dropped 20%, recovered. And by the end of 1972, you had the nifty 50. This, so I think, you know, you know now, you're, now you're six years into getting burned, inflation was growing, um, stocks weren't doing well. And I think the the world decided you better gravitate toward the best businesses um, because now you've got inflation and you want companies that have pricing power. You want companies that have some organic growth. And so they bid up the Nifty 50. And I don't know, 10 of those are, didn't make it, Polaroid and Kodak. Um, but the prices in that corner of the market were ridiculously high. The yeah. 20 or 30 of the top Nifty 50 were so expensive they were just destined to do what the big five tech companies have done here this year. Um, you weren't going to be 30 to 35 times earnings, especially when you run into advertising slowdown, you run into some competition, you run into some regulation, whatever comes down the pike, you run it, you stumble a little, and all of a sudden 35 to earnings becomes a dangerous multiple. Um, but then you had, of course, back to the nifty 50, then you had a 45% bear market. That was that was the that was the big boy of market declines since the 1930s. 45% down, uh, but then recovered to a thousand. And you know, even in 1981, 82, when Volcker raised rates, uh, the Dow dropped again below a thousand to 778, I think it was in August or September of 1982. So you're literally 1966 to 82, a thousand to 778, let's call it. Yep. So you're down almost 25%. You had dividends during that period. The payout rate at the beginning of that period was a little higher than it is now. You lost a lot of inflation in the meantime. You lost a lot of money. You lost 75% of purchasing power to inflation. 
total return, even including dividends. You lost 75% of your money. Um, and Is that what we're in for again? Well, maybe. I mean, household ownership of stocks went from 50% to 10% over that 16, 17, 18 years. Institutional pension fund ownership of stocks likewise dropped from the 40 to 50 to 60% down to 10. Nobody wanted to own a stock. And you could go to the bank and put your money in and get CDs at 13, 14%. So why would you own stocks? They're just, they just go down. Um, who owned them? If the institutions didn't own them and the private individuals didn't own them, who? Well, I'm I'm saying stocks as a percentage of wealth. All right. Okay. Sorry. And as a percentage of as a percentage of allocation. You know, clearly right. the shares were still the shares and they were still outstanding, but right. you know, the market was trading it. Uh the margins had dropped because of the inflation, in part. I mean, I've got a chart that I've that I'm working on. I'm actually gonna give a speech next week in New York. Um, at lattice work moi and i'm i've got my, my early series of charts which is why I'm, I'm, I'm not jumping the gun on the letter i'm doing this for my talk which i'm then going to incorporate into the letter so i'm cheating so, a little by getting ahead of it but but profit margins were three and the multiple was eight so he traded at 24 times sales inflation took a hammer took a machete to margins over that period but you, but but the point there was you had this series of uh fits and starts where the market would decline 20%. The Fed would then, toward the end of that decline, loosen monetary policy, lower interest rates. You'd drive the market back up. So they were always behind the curve, but they were very active. And the movements of Fed funds during that period were extraordinary. 6% down to 2%, up to 7%, back to 3% ultimately up to 20 or where, wherever they got them at the very end. But it was a very activist Federal Reserve, never quite getting behind inflation. But the T-bill investor during most of that period at least got about as much out of the bills as they got out of the inflation rate. So you were kind of stasis there. Cash would have been a great place to be. Um, we've it, as debt level but, but debt levels at the outset of the 60s were nowhere near where debt levels are today you know almost all the debt in our economy was created during world war ii we had paid that down and by the end of the 80s or by, by the end of the 70s and into that 81 82 low the high in interest rates in 81 and then the low in stocks in 82 total credit market debt was 158 percent of gdp you couldn't have a lot of debt because rates were so high here we are today at 350% credit market debt to GDP, more than $90 trillion of debt, more than $30 trillion of that is federal debt. Corporate debt is at an all-time high. Household debts here in the last two years is vastly improved until the last couple, three months because we gave money away. But the aggregate of it is over $90 trillion on a $25.5, $26 trillion economy. And you can't have a 350% total credit market debt and expect to have any growth in the economy on a inflation-adjusted, population-adjusted basis. And so to work, if, 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 if the debt burden is the greatest problem facing society and certainly facing investors, and I think it is, whether the wizards that, that, that run our central bank and the European Central Bank and the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, whether they collectively think we've got to get debt levels down, which is what I don't think they think. I mean, I think they think we need inflation and then all of a sudden the genie's out of the bottle and, oh, we need to get inflation back under control. So they're not thinking about fixing the debt burden, but we have to fix the debt burden. We have to take debt somewhere below 350% of GDP. And so you can do that in, in the extremes of a very bad deflation introducing a very bad economy like you had in the 1930s that's on the table you can let the inflation that we're seeing today morph into hyper hyperinflation it would be done globally not locally you can't flee the dollar you can't flee you can't flee the euro you can't flee the pound sterling you can't flee the swedish crown um, we'll do this thing collectively because we've all got the same debt problems we've got encumbered balance sheets globally uh, that's on the table but if you think about the 70s, and I go back to the 70s and think about what would happen if we do what we're doing today, the Fed has raised rates, they're going to raise them again by 50 basis points, they might raise them again next year until they break something, they will break something, 
And whether that's the stock market now being down not 20% on the S&P and 30 on the NASDAQ, but down 40% on the S&P and 60% on the NASDAQ, well, that would be a breakage. Um, some of the big European banks might break. Uh, pension funds might break. Some are breaking. But, you know, the, 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 the drug-addicted, cocaine-addicted stock market needs QE and they need zero interest rate policy and they're banking on getting there sooner rather than later. So now when you've got good news on the economic front, stock market behaves badly and vice versa. Uh, so we've probably got at least one or two more cycles where we break something, stock market's down, the Fed lowers interest rates by a lot abruptly and the QE lever uh, gets gets pulled again and we ramp up the balance sheet. We got it up to nine trillion, we're running it down again, and, I, and and that running down of the balance sheet is probably more troublesome for the markets and the economy than simply the raising of the uh, short money rate. Um, and we can talk about that. But if you think so, if if we're going to have a series of these bear markets, and we're going to have a series of uh, interest rate increases and declines. We know that the tax revenues will fall short during recessionary periods, and we don't really elect people anymore that uh, tolerate uh, things like less government spending. So we'll have larger budget deficits, but we will work down corporate debt. I mean, we'll have creditors become the equity owners of business when interest rates break. And there's so much corporate debt that's financed at the short end of the curve and commercial paper and floating rate debt that if you know we get two years in of inflation running hot and money rates below inflation, once you start to refinance more and more of this debt at higher yields, again, you take a hammer to profit margins, stocks will stocks will get hurt. And those of the over-levered balance sheets will lose the businesses. And that's just the classic capital cycle. That 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 that's what ought to happen. If you're an Austrian economist, that's really what ought to happen. Sure. But I can I can envision taking total credit market debt from 350% to pick a number, 250 to 200, simply by inflation running hotter than the money rate for 15 or 20 years. I mean, that's absolutely on the table. And that's no fun. That then introduces perhaps a flat market where, back to your question on, on the attribution of where earnings come from, then your multiple is likely below 15 and a half times, which is the long run average. Your profit margin of 13.3 uh, is, is now a pipe dream. And you're back where you were 10 years ago at nine, or maybe you're eight, maybe you're seven, maybe you're six. So you get a combination of margins and multiples coming back. You, know, you might have very high top line growth. I mean, this year, again, you've got 8% growth in the economy. You've got 8% nominal growth in sales. And margins are under attack. Do that for fifteen or twenty years, and it's no fun. People get pretty frustrated and 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 despondent on financial assets at that point, perhaps on real estate at that point. And it's an ugly period. But you know who won? So step back and and ask who won during that period. Certainly, the indices did not win because you went from high margins to low margins. You went from high multiples in the '60s to very low multiples in the early '80s. You got crushed. You lost to inflation massively. But Warren Buffett won. He had bought national indemnity in 1967, and the opportunity to then buy things like the Washington Post and Geico and you know, all the things that he bought in the 70s with the insurance capital and reserves, uh, the trader mindset, what we do for a living. You know, we're not manic traders, 15% annual turnover. Five or six of that is generally bringing new companies into the portfolio and eliminating companies. But there's trading within the portfolio. We're all sell things that are dear buy things that are cheaper, trying to keep the overall valuation of the portfolio cheap. And I think if if we're going to have that period and the end game there is to shrink leverage, absolute systemic leverage, you don't want to be in cash, I don't think, because we're not going to get rates up to the inflation rate. We can't because debt levels are far higher than where they were again throughout the 60s and 70s. I think businesses wind up being a pretty good store of value. And if you get the extremes of deflation slash depression or hyperinflation. Nobody wins in any of those environments. You know, if you've been in Venezuela, Argentina this year, your stock markets there are up 100, 150%. Turkey's market is way up. Stocks go up during hyperinflations, but you lose 
more than up to the decline in the purchasing power of your currency. So it's... I mean, you're you're painting quite a bleak picture. I mean, I, it's not a picture I disagree with at all. I mean, I, I think, you know, a period in which we've got much more volatile markets, in which we've got some margin compression. I mean, it was interesting you were saying that the move from 9% to 13% in the, the 2010s to 2020, 2020, 2011 to 2021, being 3% from interest rates, 1% from corporate taxes, well, both of those are going to reverse. And margins, operating margins, are already pretty high and will be eroded by inflation. So um, compression in the multiple. What, what this means, however, is that we're probably, the last thing you want to do is be in an index fund because you've got to be, <laughs> and it's, it's, I find people look at me incredulously when I say, well, you know, I'm a believer in kind of decade long cycles. So you get to the end of a decade and you should probably do something different the next decade from what you did in the previous decade. I mean, that's kind of been, that's kind of worked. And so owning the fangs was good in the 2010s, unlikely to be good in the 2020s. Being a passive investor was good in the 2010s, reasonable in the 2000s, not brilliant. But it, being passive, I think it's going to be a disaster. Is that reasonable? Well, I think when you bracket your time series and you're a passive investor, when margins and multiples are both high, you're destined for a mediocre, more likely a very poor experience. You're going to lose money. Um, you bought the, If you were an index investor in, in at the end of 99, you lost money for a decade. And you had periods during that decade where you were down 50% and then down 65%. Assuming you so, stayed in. Yeah. <laughs> assuming you stayed in. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> assuming you stayed in. You know, if you were a passive investor and came into the market in 08, 09 at the lows, you, you had a delightful experience. I, you, you're still in an overvalued market uh, by historical yardsticks. Inflation is higher than it's been. I'm not sure. I, I, I believed until more recently that I thought the end game here was probably deflation an absolute decline in the price level. I don't think we appoint central bankers and we elect people that will tolerate that. I think they'll lose it on the inflationary side. Well, I think inflation's here and it's here to stay, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, we're, we've got, in the UK, we've got strikes. <laughs> I mean, it, it, there are so many parallels with the 1970s um, here. I mean, I, I know the situation's slightly different in the United States, but I don't, I don't believe it's radically different. And, you know, I, I think we're, we've thought inflation is out the is, is escaped. And I don't think it's possible to rein it back in. And, yeah, I mean, I, I know you could liken some of the recent excesses to Japan in 1989. Um, but I'm not sure that... Um, I'm I'm not sure that we've got a Japanese like situation. I think we're much more. But we'll see. I mean, the interesting thing is, of course, that none of us know because we can't really look back at history and say, "Oh, it's like the 1970s." But the 90, as you say, the 1970s, you didn't have debt to GDP being uh, so high. So, I mean, you know, if Paul Volcker was appointed tomorrow or his equivalent, he couldn't put interest rates up to 15 or 20 percent because he, you know, the government couldn't afford it. I mean, it would just, you know, it's just an Im impossibility. So we've got, uh, I, I mean, it's an, it, it's interesting, fascinating. Listen, um, I mean, it's been so um, wonderful of you to give up your time and been fascinating to talk to you. I, I did tell you, but forgot to remind you before we came on that I usually finish by asking people to recommend a book or books. Have you got a book that you would recommend? To I, I pulled a book off the shelf that I think any young investor uh, or investors that don't live in the financial statement should read. And it would be one called The Smart Money Method. Oh, no, you're not allowed to use No, you're not allowed to do that. Oh. I really, I'm really impressed that you've got my book. Did I send it to you? No, I bought it. You bought it even better. I, I get one pound 25 for every book. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful teaching tool. It's a great book. Um, well, that's very sweet no. of you, but you're, you're, you're not allowed to, to recommend my book. You've got no, to recommend I, a real so, book. Well, well I, did, I just did. You, you can edit this out if you like and and cut but, it, well, but, then, but, but then I'll tweet about it. And so you really can't get rid of that. Um, two books that I've recommend, America's Great Depression by Murray Rothbard all the time. 
uh, given the period we're in, given uh, the leverage that we have, you got to know about the depression and you need to know about central banking and, and the Austrians and the Mises Institute in, in Auburn, Alabama, um, have a wonderful archive of literature, a wonderful archive of books. This is, this is the must read, um, because you, you have to have, you have to have a sense of a macro framework today, given debt levels and given what's going on. And you need to know that this conventional wisdom where Ben Bernanke was just given a Nobel prize because he studied the great depression. <laughs> um, he, he, he didn't study that version of the great depression. I can tell you. Um, well, so the, the, I think that's a must read. And then the other one, you know, I'm asked all the time about investing abroad and famous investors that I admire have been in things like Alibaba. And I've always said, look, I'm not going to places where I don't have the rule of law and I don't trust the political infrastructure. And so for that, I would never, ever, ever directly invest a dollar in a company headquartered in Russia or in China. I don't directly invest in emerging markets. I'd rather get my emerging market growth with companies that are building plants. Heineken, for example, um, a lot of capital spending in, in emerging markets, building plants at 20 points on capital. Plenty of growth that way. But instead of me having to explain it in my aversion to uh, finding myself in inhospitable places, I mean, we have Ken Ross Gold in the portfolio, and they had about 12% of the reserves in Russia. They lost them this year. They sold them in a fire sale. You ought to read this book, Bill Browder's Red Notice. It's been pretty widely uh, talked about, but I, it was gripping. It's uh, uh, just, just just read the book. And if you don't come away from that saying, why in the world would you ever invest dime one in a place like Russia, then you probably ought not be managing other people's money. So I'd, I'd read that. He's got another one that I haven't read yet, but it's supposed to be just as good. I, I read his book quite recently, and I've got his his latest book on my in my reading pile. So I'm going to be reading that at Christmas. It was a fantastic, a fantastic book. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it's quite funny because one of the roles I had at one of the hedge funds, um, I used to sit next to a former Russian paratrooper, and we used to do we used to do quite a lot in Russia. And I remember having a, a massive argument with uh, one of the bosses because he wanted to buy a Russian gold miner. And I said, you know, this doesn't make sense because the time that you want to be in gold is exactly the time that you don't want to be in Russia. And there was, we had the, I mean, it, it was a very amusing argument. I said, you know, I said, if things go badly wrong the, and the gold price goes through the roof, the chances are that owning the gold in Russia won't be the best strategy. And it just, it seems so obvious to me. I mean, it wasn't, I wasn't, you know, prescient about Putin or confiscation of assets or, or anything else, but it's a, it's certainly, I mean, it's a very strange place to invest. So we did it quite a lot there. And, uh, you know, I remember going to a conference in Moscow and it was really quite scary. The whole thing was a scary experience coming back to my hotel, you know, quite late at night and walking along the street in, you know, the center of, of Moscow, good area, plenty of bars and, you know, people around. And I got stopped by somebody who claimed he was a policeman and wanted to see my passport. And I was within a hundred yards of my hotel. And I said to him, yeah, sure, you can see my passport. You can come to the hotel. And I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't let him stop me. But, you know, you think, you get in the door and he's got, he's evaporated. Yeah, yeah. You know, and you just think that's that, that you know, you know that you're not safe. You know that, that brought it home. That brought it home to me. Yeah, Russia is a, a very. Yeah, Bill ran. I mean, I, I'm not going to give the story away, but you know, he ran our British capital, and you find yourself, and you know the outcome, obviously, because you know what's happened yeah. in Russia. But you think, why in the world are would you do this in the first place? I mean, obviously, it's risk reward, and you know, I'm. I, I, I'd cotton toward more of the risk management side uh, than the infinite unlimited upside of that, that some of these uh, opportunities present, but I was, I, I wouldn't be a good venture cap investor either. No, I, I, I think you probably would, but um, you, you, you might be, a, you, you might not be able to spend the money quickly enough. I suspect you'd be, you, 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 you wouldn't be spraying it around quickly. Uh, I would have a hard time laying it out. I'm, 
it might work 10 years from now is is not my bailiwick. It's been such fun talking to you. I can't wait for you to come to London. I don't know when I'm going to be in St. Louis again, but um, hopefully well, we'll manage to meet up. To, Before you go, come, uh, where can people come, find sure. you? And what should what should they know? Well, sorry, Steve, I cut you off there. I'm sorry. You, you, you had threatened to come to the Berkshire meeting, which you really need to do. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I probably should come next year. Um, I don't know why I've never, I've, I've never made it there. And I, it's a big gap in my education and one of those things that you should always have on your, on your list. And it sounds like a great fun weekend. So you probably, I'll probably see you there and I will buy you a drink if you can find one that's one pound 25 to pay you back for the book. But um, no, I really look forward to meeting up in person, but just before we finish, um, you're on Twitter. I am regrettably on Twitter. I think um, it's yeah. been fun. I'm having fun with Twitter, but I am at, I think I'm at Chris Bloomstrand on Twitter. Pretty straightforward. The website is the firm name, semperaugustus.com. Uh, I'm on, ins I'm on, I'm not on Instagram. Um, I'm on, and I'm not on Facebook. I, I have a Facebook account, but I only look at it. I don't even look at it. It was hacked and I can't even figure out how to turn it off. It's been three <laughs> years since I was hacked. And so I don't even, I, no, I never hit the link to log it in. Um, I'm on um, um, LinkedIn, but I don't use the LinkedIn. So I get, you get three or four people every day that want to have you that join your network, but I've never used it as a platform. So really find me on the Twitter. Twitter is the place Twitter that people and, can find you. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. This has been great. It's been a lot of fun. Claire Barrett runs a podcast for the Financial Times with, I think, over 100,000 listeners. And she told me my podcasts were good, but too long, especially for a commuter. So I've been trying to keep them shorter. But I could have carried on talking to Chris for another hour quite easily, although I do like to respect my guest's time. I'd encourage letters to read his Semper Augustus letter, which I shall link in the show notes. And I 100% endorse Chris's comments about the importance of studying the financial statements. It was funny how he talked about understanding the accounting policies, especially those for revenue recognition, because that's also what I talk about. It's remarkable, in fact, how similar our approaches are. And for those of you who want to improve your skills in this area, I'm doing a cohort-based forensic accounting course based on the one I do for institutional investors, just a bit simpler. You can find out more on the website or by emailing info at behindthebalancesheet.com. If you enjoyed this, you'll be pleased to hear we have more episodes planned. Subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss them. Thank you for listening.